Mm -hmm. So it's starting. There we go. Okay. Joining on the show today, Mark Jarvis, uh, someone I've known in the industry for a while. He's been around doing, uh, been called out by several top people in the league. I guess you could say Jim Nagy really likes you. Uh, you do some, now you're doing some scouting consulting. So you do some professional services and what else are you doing at this point, Mark? Uh, that's largely it. Mostly just running Jarvis scouting services right now. I just help agents out with identifying and evaluating potential players to, uh, to pursue. And so, yeah, Mark Jarvis now on the show and, uh, yeah, so one of the things that I wanted to kind of get into talking about with you was how did you get into this part of the industry? You know, because when you started doing this, there wasn't a lot of people, I don't think, that were really on this specific, you know, we're going to help agents and scout and that kind of stuff. And it seems like, you know, from people that I've known in the industry, some of the work that I'm doing now, that's opened the doors to people now with agents looking for, you know, consultants, people that watch tape to tell them who to do. So how did you tell take us down that journey a little bit, that road of how you ended up doing what you're doing now? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think, first of all, it was just a gradual move from, okay, I get out of college. I'm trying to find something that fits what I do. And I've always been more on the report writing side. I never was big into writing articles and doing the main media stuff. That a lot of people in draft Twitter do and um you know i was looking around and i the what's on draft stuff was not working it wasn't going where i wanted it to go and i'm like what can i do that just sticks with reports right where i can just continue to just say let me watch players let me evaluate them and, and um just watch football pretty much and um it just seemed like the next natural step was to go that route where it's more of the professional side more of the hey who needs uh, valuations done and, and agents are certainly in that market um, more than I think any fan would ever be at least on the players that we generally tend to watch for agents yeah and you get into some of the really deep guys too like some of the what the media refers to as deep sleepers and you're generally on top of some of these guys before anybody else is but so when you started like when you what you do now with evaluating eight for agents and stuff was there a specific client or was there something there that was like it kind of opened that door and opened that idea yeah i had a few agents contact me back when i was doing what's on draft stuff and they were just like hey do you have thoughts on this guy you know can you watch him tell me what you think and that sort of opened the door i guess you could say um but it wasn't something that i until i got out of college really thought about where i'm like okay what's the next step um, but yeah, being able to have agents reach out while I was doing the media stuff kind of, oh, maybe this kind of plants the seed a little bit, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it was a gradual evolution basically yeah. from what, what's on draft to what you do now. Yeah. And I think having the, the audience, I guess, of guys like Jim and other people that like you typically get in the media side certainly helped put me on the radars of those agents um but again it was a it was a very gradual thing i mean i've i've once i've worked with agents for years but like i've been in contact hey what do you think about this guy what do you think about that guy for probably about three years um and so just gradually transitioning it's they're certainly interested in in that type of uh information for sure and i would think that there's a lot of agents out there well, obviously, there's going to be some that really do understand, they know the game. But I would imagine that there are also a lot that are more on the business side, the contract side, and don't know necessarily as much about the game. Is that fairly accurate, perhaps, to say? Yeah, for sure. You get a wide variety of, of agents out there in terms of just the level of knowledge they have on the game and, and where they're coming from, their background. So you get a pretty good... Some guys, you don't, don't know much about it yet. They're just getting in, and some people, it's... It's a 20, 25 year bet who could probably run circles around me. So, <laughs> and so, it, I don't know if I if I'm allowed to ask this. If I'm not, just tell me no. But how many clients do you have right now that you do work for? Uh, the thing with it is it's pretty intermittent. Like you'll have mm -hmm. sometimes. Right now, I haven't had a lot of work because everyone's pretty much signed. 
for the most part, the guys they're looking to sign, you're still getting yeah. some things here and there, but largely we're pretty deep into the draft process. All the SRAs are signed for the most part. Um, so I don't have a ton of work right now with agents, but I was pretty busy with, I would say about half a dozen that uh, were contacting me and wanted reports up until I want to say about early January and then it kind of tapered off. But um, yeah, right now it's, I would say a consistent about half dozen. I haven't built up that larger audience yet to where, I mean, it can be more, but. I mean, considering this, that this is not a field that has been, you know, attacked per se. Mm -hmm. It's not a, it's not a part of the industry that's been tapped at this point. I, I would say six is a pretty good number, you know, to, or half a dozen or around that number. That's a good number for now. But um, yeah, because this is, you open the door for people like me that do this stuff on, on Twitter and, and all that stuff and found a way to kind of start building contacts, um, monetizing some of the work a little bit, which is awesome. And so I appreciate, you know, a little bit of trailblazing that you did going down that path, kind of starting that, opening that up so that agents were all like, hey, you know, there's, we can get multiple opinions and stuff. And it's been really cool. Yeah, um, and we'll add to uh, real quick is that I think um, of all the people in terms of building out that network, I'm a pretty bad networker. So <laughs> oh, just open the door. It's for guys like you can run through it a little bit more than I can in, in the short term. Hopefully I'll catch up in a little bit, but yeah, you're a much, you're a much better networker than I am, John. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes I think I, so when I was deployed, I kind of learned that I was ADD a good bit and I had a lot of those tendencies, you know, you just don't think about it much. And I'm sitting over there like, you know, bouncing my knee in the truck or whatever, doing whatever we're doing. I'm just like, yeah, just all, there were all these little pointers and they kept saying, what are you ADHD, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, I kind of am. So I think if I, I can network with people that are like that really well, but sometimes not great. Um, but no, so yeah, so that was kind of one of the big things I think that really put you on the map per se, right? So like people started recognizing you, not just on Twitter, not just, you know, through, you know, what's on draft, but really started understanding that there's this guy, Mark Jarvis, and he really knows his stuff. And it was when Jim Nagy started, you know, retweeting you and, and those conversations that you guys would have and stuff on Twitter. So did that open the door for you perhaps to start really working and well, maybe not working, but making NFL contacts, get it becoming friends with people that are in the league? To an extent, um, like I said, I'm not a great networker. Um, yeah. So it, I haven't established a ton of those connections. Um, I have a few and the few that I do have, I'm, I'm pretty good terms with and, and I've heard some good things in terms of just how people um, around the business view me. Uh, but obviously, again, I don't have a particularly wide ranging network, so uh, I can't. <laughs> oh, yeah, everyone in the league loves me. No, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm a perfect, so there, there's nobody that you can point to that you're like, hey, everybody loves that guy in the league. You know, it's just the league is the league. You're going to know some people you're going to, you know, you're going to make enemies here and there. Like, it's just it's just going to happen. Yeah. You know, it's just humanity. I think part of it, too, is that, you know, once people do kind of get familiar with my work and, and, and interacting with me, I think they kind of know what they're getting. It's just one. I don't know what what everyone else thinks of it beyond my circle, so I can't speak to that. But hopefully people do see it and, and uh, you know, look into it or at least uh, engaged by it and, and find it to be insightful, because more than anything, I'm just trying to largely copy what the league does. So. That's that's what the NFL does. It's called the copycat league for a reason. You know, like I just had uh, Lori Fitzpatrick on this show and that episode actually just went up before, right before we started recording. But she, you know, we were talking about schematics and some of the stuff that's really deep in the league. And that was one of the things that came up is everybody's trying to copy everybody, you know, because you've got people like Debo Samuel, Cooper Cup, you know, that are these certain skill type players that were schemed. To, to work and kind of fit into different molds that aren't traditional with the league. And because of that, they've been successful and productive. And so like everybody's trying to copy everybody. So like that's, that's nothing new, but it was just, I, I have a lot of respect for you in the terms of what you did 
on our side of it with with the creation and getting into scouting stuff and really opening that door with agents and stuff and that's been great so and i think that's really helped you know the industry at this point and it's going to continue to do so as you know more and more people start getting involved and you know you just opened up like a whole other platform essentially and i think that's great <clears throat> now when we were talking Several months back, we were talking about grading and some different stuff like that. And I definitely wanted to talk about that a little bit more because we had discussed kind of potentially jumping on a Zoom call and talking about it. But my, you know, my being nine hours off from, you know, home was rough trying to deal with that and deal with my responsibilities. And then, you know, the Middle East is crazy. So I thought it'd be awesome to kind of get into that a little bit. And because what we had talked about was grading with like a, you know, a, a number value system. And that was something that you said that you were against. So I thought maybe talking a little bit about your grading style and then we could kind of work into some of that would be a good start. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would just say, where do you want to jump off with that? There's a lot of ways you can go with that. Where okay, does... so when you're evaluating a player, where do you start? What's the first step in evaluating a player? Well, first, I want to make sure, OK, do I have the right information on the guy? So I kind of build out my sheet of, hey, here's the guy's background information. I don't go through and write like, oh, here's all of his, you know, stuff from the school and all. I just check, OK, do I have the the right year? Do I have the right number? Like all that sort of stuff, hometown, everything that I need to kind of fill out the report uh, format. Um, and then I'll turn on the tape. I got to figure out, obviously, which games I want to watch. Um, usually I go chronologically, so I'll do I want to get, if it's a lower end guy, it depends if I'll do two or three games, but uh, I want to get an early season uh, game and I want to get a late season game just so I can see, okay, was he playing hurt in one portion of the season? How did he change it all? If it's a guy that is, uh, is pa passes the reject test basically, then, um, then I do extra games on that guy, but that's kind of how I set it up for starting the report. Okay, uh, so let's, let's start there real quick. Okay. The reject test. <laughs> what, is, what is the reject test? It's essentially just how many games do I need to do on a guy before I would put him in a bucket. I, I do a, I do kind of like a bucket system, right? So I got my grading scale right behind the laptop here. So I've kind of got seven different buckets that I can put guys into. Now there, it gets more granular than that for like average starter, above average starter, quality starter, that sort of thing. But generally the buckets are pretty wide ranging between you've got like a gray bucket, which is like reject, you know, maybe French trial, but don't do not recommend he's not going to make a 90. You got a red bucket, which is kind of like, hey, fringe camp guy, maybe a tryout, but he's not going to ever make a practice squad. And then uh, it just goes down the list bucket by bucket to where you eventually reach like, okay, this guy's elite. Um, and so guys that don't reach a certain level on that, um, I'm not going to spend, you know, three hours watching a guy who's going to be a, a fringe tryout player, right? Like you just don't have time. You just got too many guys to go through. So I try to, uh, based on, okay, two games in, is this guy possibly a 90-man guy? If not, I'm not going to have him. Uh, I'm not going to do a third game, essentially. So you establish whether he's a reject, one of these fringe players, and if he is not, and you continue on with the evaluation, what is that next step? Well, I think all players, I start with doing the body type. So I want to mm -hmm. see, okay, for the position, what's this guy's frame? You know, is he undersized? Can he put more weight on? How is he built? You know, does he have a long long arms? Is he high cut? That sort of stuff. I just want to get feel for physical profile wise, who is he? Um, and that's ha regardless of whether a guy's a reject or a non-reject, wherever they fall on that scale, I have to figure out physically what is he? Let me watch a game. Let me take down some notes on the body type. Um, I'll look at a lot of these guys, you, lower end guys, they might not have like, you can't get good views of them necessarily sometimes. So you might look on Google and see, hey, they got screenshots of this guy. Um, like did Getty images take a good photo of him? You can see how long his arms are. Or mm -hmm. some of these guys, you'll pull up their their social media accounts and you can see, okay, here he is standing next to a 6'2 guy and he's a head shorter and they're saying he's 6'1". Well, he's clearly not 6'1". You can, you can pull out information like that. Um, so that's the first step is just let me body type the guy, see how he's built, get that down. Um, 
and then I'll start actually, okay, let me look for physical traits. Is he explosive? Is he agile? Um, is he is he a guy that um, is a high effort player? Is he chasing constantly? Things like that. Then when, once you get through the body type stuff, it's like, okay, let me look for more of the physical attributes to his game. That I can see that too. So the, there's no real set, you know, like what's the, like a, a checklist that you're kind of going through with, let's say, um, going just touching on the reject thing again for using this as an example there's no certain set checklist like they have to hit these things to not be considered that or is that just more of a subjective sort of ideal that you pick up while you're watching the tape yeah it's i have a threshold for guys that i watch and i'll go ahead and just say it it's not anything groundbreaking mm -hmm. my list is basically if you started three games of your junior season at a power five you're on my list if you started six games of your junior season at a G5, you're on my list. If either of those, you had a full season prior of starting, like let's say you started as like a sophomore and then you got hurt and missed your junior year, but you have a full season starting, you're also on my list. And then you'll have guys that maybe they didn't start because they're behind a really deep group, but mm -hmm. they're productive, they were on the field a lot. Let's say a guy has nine sacks and he wasn't a starter, but he was high rotational guy. Okay, you add him in. Um, and with bigger schools like in Alabama, Ohio State, you're going to get more of those guys where they yeah. weren't starters, but they can contribute and you want to watch them. But um, that's kind of how I establish who to watch. And then once I actually start evaluating, then that's where that like reject test comes in of, OK, I've gotten two games into this guy. I've got a good feel on who he is as a player. Do I want to keep going or am I fine with just two games? Because I so when I had, was down in uh, Mobile 2020, um, I was talking with I think it was Brian Perez who writes for the um, Draft Wire, correct? Or maybe he has his. I think he's at the uh, Draft Network now. Oh, is he? Okay. So I was writing. I was talking to him, and he was talking about being in the CFL and running, like basically doing scouting work in the CFL, and they had. They're, they had a reject test, quote unquote, and it was three simple things. Is he big enough? Is he fast enough? Is he strong enough? That sums and it they, up. <laughs> and they and they kind of like, you know, they took it from there. If you could check two of those, then you were a reject. And so <clears throat> I think that's kind of where I start when I put on the tape is, is he big enough? Is he fast enough? Is he strong enough? And then once I have a feel for, for that stuff, I'll move on to the next level and say, yeah, I'm going to continue watching this guy. But so that's, I was wondering like if there was some sort of set, certain pertain, you know, like this is how we do it. This is how I kind of figure out whether he's a reject or not. That was kind of what I was, but um, it sounds like with you, it's more subjective. You know, it's just, you've watched so much tape on players over the years that you can kind of tell those first couple games, like this guy, he's not going to make it. Yeah, I guess so. And it, a lot of that does factor in like the, is he big enough? Is he strong enough? Is he fast enough? Like that largely determines for most guys, you can use that as an indicator, right? Um, I think when you're at that level of like a starting power five player, generally, even if you're not, the biggest or fastest or strongest guy, you still have some trait that, okay, this is why you're starting power five, right? That's mm -hmm. still a player that even if they don't have the traits to play in the NFL, they're going to get evaluated by an NFL scout. And so looking that, at that from the perspective of an agent, like those guys largely from P5 and G5 make up a good majority of the league. They make up about 85%, I think, of the league. Mm -hmm. So those, that's, you don't want to just go, yeah, reject, 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 reject all the way down the line unless you're big enough, strong enough, fast enough is like at a certain threshold where you're not killing too many guys, if that makes sense. Like if I see a, if I see a linebacker yeah. who's like 5'9", 210, runs a 4'8", and I can see that in, you know, 20 snaps, okay, he's not going to make it. But <laughs> generally speaking, the guys that start power five at a certain level, it's okay. They have something that's going to be worth at least watching. Uh, and scouts are going to look at them for the most part. Yeah. So once you get past that part and you start getting into grading, how do you determine where they fall into your buckets? 
so I have my grading skills split up into basically three things. I have trait grades. I have the overall player grade, which is like a floor ceiling type of grade. And then I have the overall buckets that they go into. And so what I'm doing when I'm watching a guy, I'm putting down the trait grades and I'm not putting them into the report yet. I'm just I'm just noting and saying, OK, here's kind of what I'm feeling. So I see a rep, let's say, of a, of a linebacker closing on the running back. And let's say he's just a little bit late. Not not like he's slow poking, but he's just a little bit late to get there. I go, OK, speed wise, what does that kind of fall into? Maybe that's like five, six on my scale, which is like. OK, he's going to struggle regularly. He's going to struggle consistently, but he's not like a too slow to play. And he's not like, a hey, he's going to make it there in like starter time. Like he's not that type of athlete. Mm-hmm. And so it's just kind of feeling out, OK, what is he in all these different traits? How do I grade him in that relative to like what the expectation is? Um, and then once I start finishing up the evaluation, I start getting a feel on who the player is. Then I'll start saying, OK, what are what am I feeling for an overall grade? Like, what am I feeling for? Well, he's got let's say he's a he's a height, weight, speed guy who, you know, is a slow processor and not particularly strong. Is that a guy that is going to be developed into a starter? Is he going to be stuck as a backup teams guy? Where does he kind of fall along that spectrum? Um, and so once I get down to like, you know, that second, third game, I start to get a pulse of, OK, do I keep going on this guy? Do I keep watching more games? You know, I can eliminate if he's going to be a, you know, reject or if he's going to be an all pro pretty quickly. But um, yeah, I would say around around that point is when I can say, OK, let me start putting down more of a subjective overall grade based on the traits I've seen. Does so that make you sense? like? Yeah. So so what you're basically doing is you're looking at the traits. And putting that together into a, some sort of a scale, essentially. Yeah. Where. And then combining those together. No, it doesn't. Kind of traits. It doesn't like I don't have a particular equation to like mm-hmm. together an overall grade because I think what a player can be is very subjective. And you might have a guy who he grades out terribly in most areas, but he has like three or four things that he's really, really good at. Well, right. that guy can make a roster in the right situation. Or you can get a guy who is just mediocre across the board and just can't make it just because he doesn't have any one trait to stick, right? Like, you get you get a wide variety of players in terms of what they're capable of and what they can do. So you don't want to just let the scale and the equation kind of just blend together and, like, let, determine who the player is. You want to know, okay, based on the traits this player has shown, can he be a guy that makes a roster, right? I'll give you an example. There is a, a defensive tackle that I watched, I want to say, a couple weeks ago. And very, very middling athlete, not a guy who's going to generate much in the way of the pass rush. Um, but he's got great size, really good length, knows how to use it. He's very reliable in the run game, can take on double teams, um, not going to get knocked off balance. Just a very sturdy run defender. Got really good eyes, um, tracks the ball well, gets off blocks on a pretty timely manner. But again, no pass rush value. But he's a guy who... Athletically, if you just took, okay, what if, what is he as like a pass rusher? You would throw this guy away because he, he doesn't do anything there. But there's another right. game to where it's, okay, that alone is going to help him make a roster. Just because he's so big, he's so strong, it's going to work. Um, and so you just want to make sure you're not just kind of combining all your trait grades together and just throwing that into a bucket and saying, okay, that's my final grade because that's mm-hmm. – it's not how players work. You get guys who have very high highs and low lows that make it, and you have guys that are more that middle average that don't just because they don't have anything to build their game around. And I think that's a fair point because this is one of the things when we, you know, when we were texting several months ago and kind of talking about grades and how we did it and stuff, that, you know, we had, we had talked about that combining traits and different things, and so I've got my system pulled up too because I knew we would talk about it. Um, basically, I like to look at, you know, the overall subjective, like, get an overall picture of where this athlete is now. I think that's my intention uh, with a grade is because when I put a scouting report out, I'm going to explain, you know, in the overall, on the overview, basically say, well, here's where he could be because he has a good ceiling mm-hmm. and there's a lot of upside value. 
or here's where he's, you know, there's not a lot of upside value. This is kind of where he's going to be, you know? And so the grade I think is to me is more of a, this is where the player is right now at this present time. Um, because I do do, I do combine my trade, my traits together and into a grade where, you know, I'll put, Let's say I've got an edge rusher, for example. Um, That's what I have pulled up at the moment. I'm going to put, you know, a good 45% of the report is going to be on the athletic ability. You know, there's going to be another 25% that's going to be on their pass rushing mechanics. And there's going to be another 26 that's like, or 25% that's pure defender. You know, like basic defender stuff, tackling, pursuit, motor, different things like that. And and then, of course, a person, you know, persona, personality type stuff, like, is there going to be any red flags there, blah, 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 locker room chemistry, anything that's all very subjective, too. But you start putting that together, everything's weighted, you know, so that you're not putting, you know, 10 traits together and they're all the same trait and combining them, you know, so 10 points for each trait and then you combine them together and you end up with this weird grade because you know like you said that defensive tackle you're talking about he might not be a great pass rusher might not offer anything there and he falls off you know because your grade is screwed up Mm -hmm. so you know i do different positions i have like you know like a one tech nose tackle and a three tech defensive tackle so there's a difference you know between those i don't just have an edge rusher i have a rush edge you know so somebody who's going to be better in a three four you know, to, to try to break up those, you know, those distinctions so that I can hit those points finer with the grade, you know, by adjust because you're not going to grade a 4-3 defensive end on, you know, dropping back into pass coverage most of the time. They might do it. People are starting to kind of do that in the league. You might have to start accounting for that. But at this point, that's not a big enough, you know, factor into a grade. Whereas a 3-4 rush edge, you're going to have to grade him in pass coverage. You know, is he capable of dropping into the flat? Can you drop him into the middle of the field? You know, different stuff like that. So I do see your point where it's so easy for this to get messed up, you know, in the sense of you're not under you, by putting a number on it, like a final grade per se, you're losing that high low ability you know like the flexibility where that player could be so i definitely see that oh um, and i'm ta- i'm assuming that's where you come into the equation you know with your system because you're trying to account for that more so than just a normal scouting report yeah well i would say i think there's kind of two things we can touch on here um first i want to touch on the just the differences in like a weighting system and, and some of the problems I've found with that. Um, and also we can get into more and how I do it. But first I'd say I'd, I'd ask you to like, let's just say, imagine, imagine the four, three DN, right. And you have, yeah. I imagine a certain percentage of a trait is like a certain percentage of the final grade is based upon a single trait, right? Yes. So you would have, let's say tackling, actually, that's not a good example. Let's just say bend. Bend is, let's say, what, on your, do you have that somewhere in there? Yeah, bend would be, so bend is kind of broken up into two parts. You've got, like, balance, Mm -hmm. essentially, and bend is about 10% of the grade. Okay, so that's total 10%, right? Yeah. Okay, the question I would ask you is, do all 4-3 DNs win with 10% of their bend? Like, is that 10% of their game? You get so many different varieties of player. There are going to be guys that win with their bend. There are going to be guys that win with their you know, power, like you get all different types. And so if I just say hardline, I want this to be worth 10% of the grade. If a guy is really, really good at bending and that's like the center of his game, you don't want to, you know, let that pull him down. If you have a, a weighted grading system like that, you have to say, okay, are, is my weight perfect? Because if my weight isn't perfect, all these different types of players are going to fall into this net and they're all going to be treated the exact same way. In reality, they're wildly right. Different. Right, and so somebody that comes to mind, you know, specifically because of bend, 
you brought that point up. If someone like Josh Uche a couple of years ago, if you remember, like everybody was talking about his crazy bend. Remember that senior bowl rep where he was almost parallel to the ground and it was insane. I forget who he was working against. I think it was that North Carolina kid that didn't end up going anywhere. Um, but he comes off that edge and he has that bend and you're just like, wow, like you're mind blown, you know, Oh my God, like this guy, he can do this. But what, where else did Josh Uche win? Was kind of the, became the problem. You know, his hands were okay. They weren't great. He didn't really have a lot of power. So he kind of relied on his speed and bend. And that's kind of what I'm trying to catch with my weight is you can have a guy that can win. Yeah, like you said, bend is a big part of his game. And that can be accounted for, you know, whether you're going to put an extra tight end over there and you're going to double him for, you know, like a chip block, that takes out a lot of bend. You know, running back, working out of the backfield, that takes out a lot of bend too. And so what I'm trying to kind of get at is the over, because of I'm not working for a team per se, I have to work all the different, uh, I have to put an overall grade together, essentially saying, this is a really good player because he can do this, 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 and this. And that's what I'm trying to catch with the weighted grade by not putting so much value into lesser traits, like trying to look for an example here. So burst is is important, but compared to like, let's say brute strength as a pass rusher, is that really all that important? Because there's not a lot of guys that can, that have the pure strength to just win in the NFL. You have to win with something more, you know? So I would knock like just pure strength down, like straight up. I would knock that down and then put, you know, like, explosion first step quickness up higher yeah than that sure. but so that's what i'm trying to hit yeah. at when i'm doing that yeah and, and that's that's completely understandable i think that's where weights are valuable but i think you also can't you do that with just in your overall grade though right like you know hey i like this guy's burst i like this guy's brute strength that sort of stuff and go down that list um but without having to kind of have your overall grade determined by the totality of your trait grades, right? Like I'll right. watch a corner and I might think this corner is super technical and he's got a bunch of great things that work well at the position. But if I crush him for agility and speed, okay, I know I'm going to grade him lower, right? Or Can't let's answer essentially. <laughs> or let's say there's a guy who, let's say it's a, sticking on the defensive end topic where it's a guy who he's got really technical hands, but he has no get off. He just can't go. And yeah. so, you know, you watch some of those guys and, and you watch, you know, the ways they win. And it's like, uh, he he looks good for a really, co like a college player. He's technical, but man, there's just not enough there to where I can justify putting a starter grade or whatever it is on him. So I think you want to make sure you're not letting the formula that you've put together for like weight be the ultimate determinant of like what that player can be, if that makes sense. Because again, going back to the guys win different ways, you can generally know, okay, this guy is, or let's, you can generally know, okay, uh, burst is more important than brute strength. But if you get a guy who's got okay burst and you get a guy who's got great strength, you take the guy with great strength because he can win more. With that. Does that make sense? Yeah. To, and that's, that's the other issue with all of this, you know, from working from a media standpoint, is there are some teams they're going to take the guy with the burst because he fits their scheme better. Mm -hmm. You know, there's other guys they want the stronger guy because that fits their scheme better. And that's, that's, that's what makes it so complicated is because you're not scouting for that specific scheme. You're taking an overall perspective, right? And so when you're writing the report, I think that's where I try to get into, here's where he's going to fit best you know and kind of break it down like that um when i this year what i'm planning on doing is going into once i start dropping actual like you know full reports full grades and stuff is really getting into stuff that's more like um here's here's a certain scheme type right let's say like a sam linebacker this guy fits that mold here's where he grades with that you know, here's a three, four edge rusher. Here's where he grades with that. And there'll be guys 
you know, the, some of the versatile guys that they'll have multiple grades because they fit multiple, those multiple different positions. And I want to grade them for those too, you know? And I just don't think that there's an overall way for me to say, I'm trying to think, I'm trying to get a really good example here of somebody. Let's take Thomas Booker out of Stanford, for example, you know, defensive tackle came in, you know, people were kind of talking about, oh, is he a tweener? Cause he was listed at Stanford at what, 270. He comes into the Shrine Bowl, weighs in at 305, can play three tech. You could probably line him at five tech. If you're in a three, four scheme, I want to account for that in my grade. You know, so he'll get graded as a three tech and as a five tech. But that's kind of where I, that's, that's where I was trying to go with the number system is it's an overall, here's where the player is right now. There were, you ha- kind of have to read the report, unfortunately, to get into where the ceiling is, where the bottom is, because there's so many different variables and factors due to scheme and all the different changes like that. I think one thing I would say here, and, and this is just something I try to apply with every player, is just don't, don't miss the force for the trees of it. Of If I ask you, what is this player? Tell me, is he a starter? And obviously you got like, okay, different schemes, all sorts mm-hmm. of stuff. Assuming he's in a in a system that plays to all of his best traits, what is he? Is he a starter? Is he a backup? That sort of stuff. So if I ask you, what is Thomas Booker? Lower tier starter, probably at this point, as a three tech. Yeah. And so that's that's you want to you want to make sure you're comfortable with where that is, rather than you know all the trait grades being perfect. Because at the end of the day, you're just trying to make sure do I have him graded overall properly. So right. the issue I ran into was I would try to I when I first started and was doing what's on draft stuff I would try to work up so I would work okay let me put all the trait grades together and then let those trait grades kind of tell me or they would decide what the player is I don't want the trait grades to decide what the player is I want the trait grades to inform me of what he does well and what he does poorly and then I can just in my experience and my subjective mm-hmm. to evaluate and say okay yeah this is like a starter t- caliber player right. <coughs> Does that make sense? Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. <coughs> um, that and that's, I I think that's the biggest issue. You know, you have is doing it on the media side. Doing this on the media side is just accounting, trying to find a, a good way to account for that. But I had wanted to bring that up because we had talked about it. And we'd said we, you know, it's really hard to talk about that over text sometimes with the, there's so much information right there that you're trying to type. And it's like trying to pass on that information effectively is, is such a challenge, you know? And so um, I definitely do see your point and I definitely understand it. And don't get me wrong. I'm picking up some real pointers here talking to you that I'm, you know, like really actually sitting here kind of considering like, okay, yeah, maybe I've messed that up a little bit. I can fix, I can tweak. I'm thinking tweaks, right? But um, I think that's what kind of makes, that's what's beautiful about this process is that there's really no right or wrong answers. You know, it's all subjective. It's all opinion. And at the end of the day, as long as you nailed what that guy is capable of doing, that's all that really matters. You know, I would add a few things. Um, one is one of my favorite examples of just where I really messed this up, and it's with quarterback, which is obviously one of the um, most Jake people. Jake Fromm going first overall. Those <laughs> memes, I still see them every once in a while. Mark Jarvis. No, uh, and that's it's it's a funny thing. Yeah, Fromm was one of those where I did mess that up just because I didn't value off script enough. I thought you yeah. could be this player thin rails type of guy, um, and you know, there's only so much you can get away with that. But the ones I was thinking of, Lamar Jackson, I really ruined that one. And then Kyler Murray really ruined that one. Um, and I mean, I had Kyler as like a solid starter. But the issue was with both of those guys, I had a system where it was weighted against uh, quarterbacks that can use their legs, right? Like, yeah, it's it was very heavy. OK, but like decision making, you know, going through your progressions, all that sort of stuff was very, very highly rated even more so than just accuracy and playmaking ability outside structure. 
And I think quarterbacks are a great ground for you to see the way different players could win because you get a guy like Kyler or Lamar who they're, they're not overly reliant on their legs, but if you took that away, they're going to be a very different player. Um, and you get, you know, how do I put this? If you try to just grade that guy on a weighted scale where it's all about what you do as a passer, you're going to miss every single time. Um, yeah. And so ultimately that's not what the position's about. It's not about necessarily like, you know, are your, is your footwork perfect in the pocket? Are you doing all the traditional things? Oh, are you mechanically beautiful? Like, no, it's, hey, can you extend plays? Can you deliver the football accurately downfield? And can you continue to move the offense? You know, and, and obviously that is going to vary from how different coaches want in. It's, you know, not every team's going to view it that way. But you don't want to see a guy who doesn't fit all the measurements or fit a weighted scale and kill him just because he's, oh, accuracy is only worth this, this percentage. Let me just toss this guy away. Or, oh, scrambling is only worth this percentage. Let me toss it away. Like, if mm-hmm. I give Lamar, like his running ability is 10% of his grade, I'm going to look like an idiot because that's way more for his game. <laughs> And that goes back to the burst bend thing. Like if I grade a guy whose game is built around burst bend, if I grade him 25% or whatever for that as a combination, I'm going to kill him. And I'm going to miss so hard just because I didn't understand, hey, this is what makes the player what he is, you know? Um, And then going back to what you were saying on the media side, I think there's the aspect of who's the target, like, and what's the end game for, for you writing report, right? Like, You want to make sure you know kind of who your audience is, um, and that can influence how you grade. Like, my grading scale is is a very wide range of outcomes because I'm grading for what are the odds of this guy succeeding to a certain extent within the league, and then transferring that info to agents, right, where I say he's going to be an average backup to an average starter. Well, I can't tell you, oh, yeah, not knowing where he's going, he's going to be an average starter. He could end up on a team where he's, he's not that, you know? Mm-hmm. But if I can say, okay, this is kind of the range. Like, okay, he's he's going to be a rosterable player. He's going to make it 53, and he's going to stick. Okay, that's important. That matters. Or if I can say, yeah, he's definitely going to make a practice squad. That matters, you know. Um, whereas on the media side, you might, oh, let me tell the fans, yeah, this guy's going to be a definite starter. Or this number 11 is going to be better than number 12 on the rankings. Oh, yeah, it's guaranteed. <laughs> like, it's a whole different ball game depending on who your audience is and, and what you're trying to go for. Um And I hate to say it this way, but like some people in the media, it's not even about going for accuracy. It's more about going for stuff that gets people to click and engages with them like mock drafts. And that's that's not a knock, like, you know, get your bag. But like if you were to go through and say, okay, what's the accuracy rate of your evaluations? It wouldn't be, you know, to the level that you would traditionally think of with a scout. So. Yeah, those are all really good points, too. And, you know, part of that is because media is such a political, you know, spectrum, you know, at this point. And that's kind of the issue, too, that you have sometimes when you're scouting or, you know, like I've been called a racist because I said something about players, you know. And I specifically one mention I remember was, you know, I was talking to people in the league and they were telling me, look, like, you know, people are talking about Kylan Hill right now. We don't have Kylan Hill that high. You know, they're talking about what was that Florida State kid, uh, the defensive tackle last year. Marvin Wilson. Marvin Wilson. He's not going that high either, you know, and I probably was poorly timed on my part, but I said something about it and, <laughs> you know, I got murdered for it on on social media. But, like, that's kind of the other issue that you kind of have, too, sometimes that you have to learn to take with a grain of salt put off to the side like it's you're not doing this personally you're not doing this because you don't like guys you know that's that's you're evaluating from a professional standpoint to tell people here he's capable of doing this and he's not capable of you know making it in the league per se or he's not everything that these people are hyping him to be or whatever whatever it comes to you know um the other example that kind of pops in my head was one of the biggest lessons I learned was the 2020 cycle with that uh, Harrison Ducros, Reed Ducros, whatever his name was, that corner that the dad was running around talking to everybody about and sending tape and everything else. And, you know, I learned a, that was a big lesson I learned that day right there. Like, you know, hey, listen to some people who are really knowledgeable, you know. But um, I mean, now we're we have the USFL about to kick off and. He was nowhere to be found, was he? <laughs> yeah, let me 
let me jump in here and I'll say two things. One, that's not to pretend like I'm some beacon of accuracy. Like I have, oh. I've been more inaccurate over the past, let's say, for, like from when I started late 2016 to I would say about early 2020, like I was horrible at evaluating players. And it was just because I didn't know what I was looking at. I didn't, you know, understand what I was doing necessarily. And I was gradually getting better. But, like, that's not to say, like, oh, people on the media side can't be accurate, that sort of stuff. It's just, like, generally speaking, you're not going back and tracking, hey, how did I hit? Like, how did I measure up? Um, it's more of just a general, hey, let's get it in the ballpark type of deal and tell fans what they want to hear. And nothing wrong with that. Um, on the on the Reed Harrison to Cross thing, I think that's interesting because – the differences between like the way that situation comes about versus like how teams evaluate it is so so different um yes. you know on the media side when you first get in you have a very wildly skewed view of like what scouting from a process standpoint really is so like i can look back on the now and say okay was well, he ranked by nfs or blesto like to start off with if, if neither of those happen then he's probably in trouble um <laughs> And then move on to that, okay, or scouts visiting, uh, where was he from, Duquesne? Yeah, Duquesne. Who are scouts visiting Duquesne and going and seeing this guy? If not, he's probably in trouble. <laughs> and you just go down that checklist of, like, did he get an all-star game invite? And if not, he's probably in trouble. Like, And you really can figure out, I guess you could say, kind of if a guy's getting any attention or not by the time, okay, pro days, combines, all that sort of stuff comes yep. around. Um. And you get a feel for when guys are BSing, right? Like, I know he didn't he didn't run because of COVID, but, like, I remember seeing stuff like, oh, yeah, he's going to jump 43 inches and have, like, a record-breaking shuttle. And I'm just like, what? Like, I didn't write him up, but, like, you watch the guy and you're like, huh? So you can – you get a lot better as a BS sniffer if you can find, you know, once you know the process, you guys like, hey, the league does not like this guy at all. Um, that's yeah. nothing bad about him. Like he he was put in a bad situation by having a, a helicopter dad that like wanted to slam media because he thought that was the way to do it. But like ultimately, you either can play or you can't play, and he's going to determine that. And media can pick that up as much as they want and make a story about it, but it's not not going to change anything. And I would also add, like, I mean, you kind of took that one on the chin too. Like you were, I remember you being deep in that one of wanting to root for Reed Harrison to Cross and thinking he was a guy and like you have one of those hit you I mean it it knocks you back down and it kind of you know it uh it adjusts your your sensors and and helps calibrate you like I yeah. have plenty of those of with my own of Burrow, Chase, Ben Kerr it all you know you could pull up a whole list of all the guys that I had no clue what I was watching and messed up severely as a result but yep it happens you you take a lot yeah. of balls when you start evaluating players it's like a true evaluation standpoint yeah and it's it's a learning process it's all about figuring out what exactly is working in the league right and i think by talking to people and that's what i like to do is i like to really talk to people in the league and talk about hey what are you guys kind of doing what are you what are you preparing for you know um and i remember i've i've brought this up before i don't know with you but uh, 2019, doing the Music City Bowl, like right before, right at the end of the 2019 season. And when I do a game like that, I like to go down on the sideline, be there as early as I can, walk around. Like literally, as soon as I can go on the field, I'm down there, like before the teams are there and stuff, and just start listening to people, you know, just listen. Because there's all kinds of, there's all kinds of years of experience of people that have done all kinds of different things you got scouts you've got coaches you just it's a awesome world and you can just walk up to these conversations and they don't care they're just going to sit there and kind of keep on talking and everybody's learning everybody's trading that information but uh it was that Steelers scout the 40 yard dash guy his name escapes me at the moment he's a guy that's sitting there at and telling the prospects to go at the 40 yard dash every year at the combine. And uh, we were talking about the Mississippi state guys. So that's who he was there to watch of Mississippi state playing Louisville and, you know, showing, just giving me just little pointers and stuff. Cause I was standing there listening to his conversations and stuff. And uh, he pulls out at one point, he pulls out a uh, Mike Gorsink. That's who it was. And he pulls out this little note card. that has got all the players written on it. 
literally every player that's draft eligible from Mississippi State. He's like, that's who we're watching. And it was like, that was when I started to realize, oh, like you watch everybody, <laughs> you know, like it's not, it's not a, hey, like we're cherry picking guys. It's like, we're watching everybody. And then uh, we get around to halftime, he comes up. He's like, so what did you notice? And the kid that was there at the time was Chauncey Rivers. You might remember him. Ended up on the Packers, did some other stuff. I was like, I first time sitting in a box. I'm like, this is awesome. I got such a great view of the field. I can see stuff. Chauncey Rivers is terrifying. And he sat there and he said, hey, so the thing about Rivers is he's a little bit of a tweener. It's like, you don't want to be a tweener. He started talking to me about how everybody in the league is going to four-man fronts because that's what's working when it comes to stopping different players. Uh, like, it's just the more effective scheme as a pass rushing, as a run stopping. And he said, everybody's switching over to this so that you can get two defensive tackles on the inside that can potentially eat up double teams. And you get a one-on-one -on -one with a defensive end and the tight end on the outside. That's what everybody's trying to do right now. And when you look at the league over the last couple of years, how many teams can you name outside of maybe the Steelers that still run a three, four, you know, base front? There's the Seahawks, I think, rotate it as well as the Jaguars and the Lions. But everybody's running four man fronts at this point, you know, and that's kind of where the league's gotten to. So I like those conversations that you have with the league. And guys that are evaluating and guys that are, you know, the coaches and stuff and talking about this stuff because it helps you as an evaluator see who might be that person in this class, like who's fitting that mold of what, where, of where it's going. It's a little bit more insight when you're watching the NFL tape going, yeah, I see what they're doing with that scheme, you know? Yeah, that's a good point. I think, you know, it's one thing that has definitely changed for the better, obviously, for me over the <laughs> I would say two years is like <clears throat> it went from being more of a, hey, let me just scout, you know, the top 250 or whatever it is and put all my reports together and try to sell it to fans to like, OK, let's understand the industry. Let's understand what scouts are doing and understand the process behind it a lot more clearly. Um, yeah. And just by listening and, and seeking out information, if you know the right places to look, you can gain so much insight just just by listening around and looking. Um, and, and obviously, Again, going back to that, I'm not as good of a networker aspect. It's been a lot more of the online stuff. Let me dig things up, you know, digitally um, for me. But, you know, you just have to constantly be in pursuit of that next nugget of information, not in terms of like a, you know, let me hear what this guy thinks about this player so it can impact how I evaluate him, but more of a, hey, what's something that I can take from how they do their process and yeah. then implement into mine in a way that's going to be effective and that overall makes me more accurate and more effective as an evaluator. And that's that's the goal at the end of the day. I guess uh, one last little thing to kind of throw out is because it is draft season and you have been watching this class extensively. Are, is there a few guys that you're thinking or maybe one guy that you're thinking is going to just kind of blow up here at this combine or in the next couple months before the draft that isn't really being talked about right now? I hate to do that because you never know, you know, you have expectations of how guys are going to test. You have yeah. ideas of like what they're going to do, but you never know how the league's necessarily going to value him. He might have something medical or a character that you don't know about. It's very tough to know. Um, just from my own personal evaluations, some guys that I'm, I really like that I think, um, I think they're going to do decently well at the combine and guys that I think, I don't know if they're going to blow up and, First round type of, but I think they're they're all guys that can be solid starters. Alec Pierce is one I like a lot. Um, I, his ball skills really really jumped out, um, and he's not just a pure possession guy either. Like he's good with his hands, trying to get releases. Um, he's surprisingly agile, um, working laterally. Um, He's he's a lot more explosive, I think, down the field than he is in short areas, but I think he's sufficient in short area. I think he's probably going to end up, I would say, running low mid four fours, and at his size, he's like six three. I think it's like yeah, one ninety five. I want to say. I thought he was bigger. I thought, I thought he was in the in the uh, low two hundreds, like two hundred five, two ten ish range, 
but I think he I think he's gonna run and jump pretty well for his size. Um, Chad Mama, I know he's is it Muma or Mama? I believe it's Muma. I'm not entirely sure. I, I actually don't focus as much on the pronunciation, but he's he's one that I like quite a bit, and I think he's probably gonna run faster than. And he's he's being billed as a as more of a from what I've seen from the little bit I've looked at media people. Um, they he's getting that like, oh he's just tough and smart. It's like the guy yeah. can. Run. He's I think he's gonna run in the four sixes. I think um, he's gonna I think he's what six three two forty ish. So I think he's going to have good numbers. Um, I don't want to put a prediction on anything else that he tests with. Um, right. But I think he's going to be pretty solid in the, in the four sixes. Let me think if there's any other guys that really pop out to me. One thing I am planning to do, and this goes back to what I was saying about like the checking your accuracy after the fact, you want to make sure you know like where you're underselling or overselling certain things about a guy. So like. Mm -hmm. I write down all my 40 predictions with the evaluation, so I have like an estimate to go with it. Um, and then I can go back after the fact and say, hey, here's what I thought the guy was going to run. How did he actually run? You know, how close was I? Was it, you know, was the tape right? Was it, you know, just the guy running faster than expected? What was the deal? So that's one thing I would add in there as well. But John, you've seen my my Twitter. I don't even talk about prospects anymore. It's all prospects. <laughs> Asking me to pick out a bunch of guys that I like is not a great. No, two guys is fine. That's fine. Like I, I was just curious because I mean, you have gone deep in the class. Yeah. And so Alec Pierce is somebody that I've looked at a little bit. I don't have an extensive look. He did. Did he do the Senior Bowl too? He was at the Senior Bowl, but I think he left after like one day. I don't know what the deal was. Because I was. I wasn't track. I don't. I don't remember seeing him at the Senior Bowl. Like going back, going through the practice tape and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but I remember him being announced as he was going there. But I haven't done an extensive thing on him. I love Muma though. I really like him a lot. And I think he's, like you said, like they're talking about him being tough and smart and you know just kind of like a downhill linebacker. I think he's a little bit more than that. And I think he'll be some kind of maybe surprisingly almost like this year, like this year's Nick Bolton, you know, where there were a lot of question marks about Bolton's ability to drop into coverage and stuff. And he did all right doing that with the Chiefs this year. So that kind of it seems to be the same sort of concern surrounding uh, Muma is the, is the coverage ability. And I think he'll be all right. Yeah. And one thing I seen. add in here, and I don't know if you want to wrap this up soon, but I'll just throw out you mentioned getting a feel for like what's actually in the league right now. And I think that is such an important thing that I undervalued when I first started because I'm more so in that like, oh, let me see who the first rounders are. And oh, that's so exciting. The mock drafts and the stock up, stock down and all that stuff that you think when you first get into it before you realize what it actually is as the scouting yeah. process. But I think this is one thing that you want to make sure you always have. You want to have a comparison class and you want to know, okay, my comparison class for linebackers is going to be all the linebackers I've studied over the years, right? And so I want to make sure I know I'm watching the NFL and saying, okay, here are the linebackers in the NFL right now. Let me calibrate my mental comparison class by what I'm seeing in the NFL. You don't want to, because everyone comes in with these expectations of what a player is supposed to look like, right? Like, you yeah. might, like with QB, for example, I came in with the expectation of, okay, everyone's going to look like a Tom Brady or a Peyton Manning. Like, that's just what's <laughs> play and then I have Patrick Mahomes, Kyler Murray, and Lamar Jackson drop down on me like that and it's like oh crap like I don't know what the hell I'm talking about and so everyone has expectations of what players are supposed to look like but you want to make sure you understand like what actually works and what actually plays in the league in the variety of ways the guys can win um, and again this all goes back to that whole grading scale how you value your trades if you put weights on that sort of stuff but like it's just a matter of you want to make sure you're this might sound weird, but as accurately imitating what the league is doing as possible because yes. that's your benchmark, right? Like that's, <clears throat> I know a lot of people were like, oh, I want to scout better than the league. You're not gonna, like just straight, <laughs> you're not gonna. No. So don't even try, like just understand what plays in the league, what succeeds in it, and then model it off that. That's, I think that's one other thing too that I've kind of dropped off from doing a lot of is that pound the table for this guy, you know? Because it is so subjective, you know, and I think I, I do develop that for it's it's not every player anymore. 
you know, like it used to be, like you used to be sitting there arguing people over, you know, oh, I think that trying to think 2019, 2020. Oh, I think Jake Fromm's going to be a great sensation hit, you know, like he's going to be awesome. Like the league's going to love him, blah, blah, blah. I love this guy. He can do this and this and that. And we just saw this year, clearly he was not. Um, I was all over the Fromm train. It wasn't just you. I was all over that one too. I loved Fromm and I liked the personality, I think more than I liked the player too, which is another lesson that I had to learn. You know, the personality, it's nice and all, but you have to separate it. But um, <clears throat> no, I think I think basically just kind of getting back on to that point is like you, it, everything is so subjective. It's not worth pounding the table for guys unless there's just the media shitting on somebody nonstop. Like this guy is, is terrible. And you're like, well, not not exactly or vice versa. This guy's the next godsend. Kayvon Thibodeau is this you know, generational prospect. Well. I mean, it's it's interesting. Again, I think it goes <clears throat> to what's the audience like I, in in terms of how you write a report or how you present it, all these sorts of things. It all goes back to like, what's your end goal? And if you're working in the media, your end goal is to captivate the viewer and, and make them want more of your draft. Content. Yeah. And you can sit there and pound the table for a guy and say, this guy's going to be this like, oh, this guy, this QB is going to go in the first round. He, he's terrible. He can't, he, he's not a good deep passer at all. He's this, he's that. And you can sit there and go on that long ramble about it because that's what's captivating to the, to the viewer, right? But like, if you're working for a team, you don't have to necessarily sit there and go on a long rant and try to, you know, keep the attention. It's like, okay, do you like him or do you not like him? And if yep. you do like him, why? If you don't like him, why? But do we want it? Yes or no? Like it, it's an entirely different audience, so you're going to approach it in a very different way. I think no matter what, you want to have confidence in your view and your perspective, but you also don't want to believe you're always right. Like you want to, here's a good way of uh, putting it, I would say is like, I've done this long enough to where I can watch a player and I can put down my grade and say, this is what I think the player is. That doesn't mean that's always what he's going to be, right? But I can say that's my perspective and then separate myself from it to where I'm not trying to go defend it to somebody of, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to get it right because of this or that or try to sit there and go back and forth. It's like, no, this is just what I had down on the player. I can separate myself from that opinion and not like wrap up my ego and my identity. And yes. And if you want, we can go down that whole, you know, psychology rabbit hole if you want to do that. That's that, that's stuff that, happy I to. mean, this is stuff that you do. You like when you tell you that's what you're talking about on Twitter now is more the psychological yeah. side of, of different. You really went into that when you. You know, you went on that giant unfollowing spree and you pissed off all those people because, you know, like, like, I think uh, I messaged you right after that or something. And you were like, yeah, like you kind of ex had, like, explained yourself. I didn't even ask. You just explained. And I was like, dude, I'm like, I don't care if you follow me or not. I had a bunch of people that were really, really upset in my DMs about that. So that's why I felt like I had to explain it to you because I'm like, oh, man, I pissed off John, too. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Like, I'm like, dude, I don't care if you follow me or not. Like, it's a it's a Twitter follow. Big deal. Like, it's a, if you blocked me and I couldn't get in your inbox <laughs> anymore, that would be different. But, you know, um, but psychology, it's it, it is such it plays such a big part of this, you know, this industry, because think you think about um I'm going to go ahead and bring him up. Angry Scout, for example, on Twitter. Like, I like a lot of what he has to say. And it's because he puts a lot of perspective on things. He just says it like it is a lot of the time. And he calls out people, you know, and one of the kind of getting the Jaguars fan base all fired up this year over uh, Balake, right? That's how you say his name, right? I have no clue. That's how you... Uh, Trent Balake, I think. Bulk. I think. I thought it was bulky, but like... Mike Again, Balky. not good pronunciation, so. I'm uh, not, not either. But, you know, like, kind of like, hey, he's been doing this to scouts for a long time, blah, blah, blah. Calling out, you know, an all-star game when they're kind of screwing with players because, you know, they're worried about their TV ratings or whatever. Calling out, um, there's another, oh, the Giants this year, the Maras and stuff, and saying, like, these guys have been in power for so long that this is why your franchise sucks. I like that. And playing into the psychological side, ego is such a huge part of this industry. Like so many people have that. So where do you, where do you kind of, how do you kind of stay? Like you said, you talk about separating. How do you kind of do that 
without, you know, I guess losing your pride in what you do, essentially. Yeah, that's a, that's an interesting question because I usually think of it more in terms of like a an ego in defense of an evaluation. You went on a much broader scale and took it to like ego in the industry in general, which I think is a fair question. Um, I've had times where I've had people like with some of my uh, grades being so obscure, like where they're like, oh, you're just lying. Oh, you're just making stuff up. And I don't know about you, but like I was raised don't lie. And my mom would, <laughs> I don't want to say like, oh, beat me or anything, but like uh, my mom severely punished me if I ever lied to the point where like I'm yeah. a terrible liar. So my wife makes fun of me. I can't lie about anything. And so I have people call me a liar because, oh man, you couldn't have possibly graded this player so low. You're a liar. You're making this. It's like, I got really hurt and my ego was hurt and my identity was hurt by that. But ultimately you have to ask the question of, is the person that is attacking me or hurting my identity, like, do I have to care what they think? And large majority of the time, no. So like, if someone on Twitter yells something at me, it's, oh, you're an idiot, you're this, you're that. It's like, you don't know me. I'm a cluster of pixels on a screen to you. Like, <laughs> I, I care what you think. And it's gotten to the point with evaluations too. Like, I might have some opinions that the vast majority of fans don't agree with or something like that. I'm not going out and screaming them at fans to tell them, hey, this is what I think about this player. This is what I think about that player. Because I don't want to, like, bring that attention onto myself. Like, I'm focused on doing it professionally. But if a fan thinks I'm an idiot, why should I care? They're not paying my bills. Like, they're not asking me for reports. So, like, oh, well. Like, I – because I have a much better – I'm in my own head 24-7. They get – they're in this tiny little sliver. They don't know what goes on in here. So, like, I'm not going to be hurt by that. Um and I guess if you wanted to, like, what's another example for, like, what you're thinking here? Because I feel like I'm kind of missing the mark just a little bit um, in regards okay. to the pride so aspect of it. People, but. let's say, let's say, I, I would imagine at some point with your interaction with agents, they've disagreed with you on somebody. Yeah, I guess so. I guess you could put it that way. I don't think any, like, egregious disagreements, but yeah. Okay, no, it doesn't have to be an egregious disagreement, but I, that's kind of what I was getting at is you have certain guys in the industry that are so prideful in what they do, you know, in the NFL, in media, that they they get so caught up in everything that they're, you know, they're, mm -hmm. they come across the wrong way, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. They come across as, like, super arrogant, super flamboyant i guess to a certain extent i i don't want to say any names of people that i'm thinking about but um like how i guess the question is more of if you have a disagreement like you know in in your professional side where you're like maybe you're not as high on a player as some as like an agent or somebody that you're talking to is or maybe they're higher and you're not or vice versa right how do you separate that that sort of pride in your evaluation from the disagreement, if that makes sense. Gotcha. I guess I would say one of the big things that you'll get in listening to a lot of the, I guess you'd call them experts, but generally it's the academics on um, the psychology of decision-making and, and organizational psychology is this idea of being able to disagree without being disagreeable. And when you disagree with me, you're not disagreeing with me as a person. You're disagreeing with the idea that I presented to you. Or if I, like you might, I might say, John, I like, let's just pick a player out of a hat. I really like Kenny Pickett. And here's why I think he's QB one. And if you say, oh, I disagree with you. I did not like Pickett's tape at all. He's QB four. Okay. Like it, I don't have to convince you that he's QB one and you don't have to convince me that he's QB four. We're just saying our opinions and saying this is what I saw and sharing our perspectives. Now, if you say, oh, he's he's QB4 and you're an idiot if you believe otherwise, okay, then you're attacking me and I can just disconnect and, okay, like, we're done, you know? I don't have an obligation to defend my opinion to someone who doesn't want to hear it and who believes otherwise because I'm not going to change their mind. Like, I can share my perspective and, and I can say, hey, if you have a different opinion from me, I'll say – John, I disagree with you, and here's why, but, like, if I, I can't change your mind, no amount of blunt force trauma of me trying to change your mind is going to change your mind, right? 
Um, and when I do disagree with you, I want you to feel like I'm not attacking you internally and attacking who you are. I'm trying to convince you of a different idea, if that makes sense. So a lot of that is just making sure you're you're not letting people who are trying to attack your idea make you feel like you're being attacked personally. And the people that are trying to attack you personally, you just ignore them because they're 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 on a different wavelength than you are in terms of what their end game is, if that makes sense. So so the the point that you're putting out is it's something that's not practiced very much anymore. Like you can look at any part of our daily lives and you know, people that are involved in our daily lives. Um your family, your friends, people that you work with, so on and so forth, is it is so difficult in, and I wonder social media plays into this a lot, to separate a disagreement, the disagreement from the idea and the person. Yeah. And that's what you're describing. And it's funny because it's like, I agree with you 100%. Like that's, that when I'm having a conversation, I'm engaging with somebody on Twitter and it ends up being an argument or on a podcast or whatever. That's I'm talking to about the idea. I'm not talking about you as a person, because at that point, I could care less. You could be the worst person in the world. but We're talking about the idea. You know, I don't care. I'm talking about the idea. And so. It's something that's so, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It's it's so rare now that people think like that. And it's, that's that's interesting, you know, that. The opinion, the idea is not you. It's an idea. You know, it doesn't it doesn't identify you as a person. A few things I would say. One, I'm going to plug one of the big things that kind of brought me down this line of thinking. It's it's um, soldier and scout mindset by Julia Galef. Um, And in the book itself is, I believe, just called scout mindset. But it's essentially the way we view ideas is we we view them from either the scout mindset or the soldier mindset. And the soldier mindset is this idea of I am defending a belief or I'm attacking a belief. Like I'm, I'm trying to either assert my position with something or tear down someone else's to be right, to prove myself right. And to like show, Hey, this is why I'm correct. Instead of the scout mindset of just seeing what's there and, and just mm-hmm. trying to build a better map. Right. And so if I'm wrong on something, if I were in soldier mindset, that hurts me. That like hurts my ego because I'm how dare I'm so stupid. I, I was wrong on something. People are going to look at me different. It's like if you take that approach, then you're going to try to defend ideas just on the principle of you don't want to be wrong because you're going to feel attacked by it. And your identity is going to be hurt versus if you just get used to the idea of like I'm wrong about a lot of stuff. That's OK. I'm just going to keep getting better. <laughs> then you're not, you know, conditioned to fight these battles with people about stuff that, you know, you're not as informed on. And so if I say something to you and I say, John, he's blah, blah, blah about the combine, I think this. And you go, no, you're wrong. Here's why. If I'm, you know, in that soldier mindset, I'm going to go, oh, I can't believe he said that to me, man. I He just showed me that. <laughs> Versus like, oh, I was wrong. Dang, I'm such an idiot on that aspect. Great. Now I'm going to this stuff. So... You know, if I'm wrong on something like it's I'm never going to be right 100 percent and acting with the mindset that I will be just is going to make me look like a fool and make me hold, you know, bad beliefs and uh, look into it and commitment bias. You just elevate and elevate and elevate until you get to where you're just saying dumb stuff for your opinion to like protect your ego and, and your status. It doesn't get you anywhere. Like, yeah. so that's uh, that's basically the idea of it, of you want to make sure more than anything you're not attaching your identity to necessarily the opinions you hold. Like if I attach my identity to being a scout who's right all the time and I, I'm wrong all the time, what does that make me? I'm, I'm ruined. If I attach my identity to I'm, you know, continually evolving, getting better as a scout, I'm going to keep going and going and going until I get really, really good at it. I can't lose, you know? Because it's that constant. I'm looking to get better. Uh, Jalen Hurts is going to come up in every single episode of my <laughs> show. It's just going to happen. But that's what he does say. You know, we're, how can I get 1% better today? And I love that idea, that mentality that I like, if we're not getting 1% better at something, then what are we doing? You know, every day. And uh, I will continue that. 
you were sitting here talking about, you know, egos and pride and, and continuing on down roads and stuff. And that, that's, I was, I immediately started thinking about Jalen Hurts and I'm like, yeah, just, I'm never going to let that one go. So, you know, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I'll always believe in that guy. <laughs> and it's, and it's interesting an evaluation aspect of it too, because you'll see so often people that like, they just get so much trenched in their belief on a player to like, I know you've seen it where they'll make their like Twitter bio, a player's name or something like number one, yada, yada, Stan. And it's like, is that, is that who, what defines you? Like, is that what you're really going to build yourself around? Or like, you see people fight so hard, you know, it's tooth and nail for players. It's like, look, once you put down your opinion, what else is there to gain? Like, unless you're looking to go back and take in the knowledge that someone else gives you and then use that to reshape your view, what are you going to gain from convincing someone else that you're right? Like you're either going to be right or you're wrong, but you yelling at someone on Twitter about it isn't going to change that at all. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. I, I just typically tend to do it every once in a while with Jalen stuff because people told me I was wrong and it's just fun to kind of be like, yeah, well, well nobody here's, expected here's, them to go to the playoffs, did they? <laughs> here's, here's an interesting part of that because Twitter culture is so weird. We're like, some people are going back and like, oh, let me get get a dunk on you because you said this is going to happen and you were wrong. Like, what purpose does that serve? Like, if you go back to Jalen Hurd stuff and you're talking about it, like, are you doing it because you feel good when you do it? Or are you doing it because you want to have a dialogue about it and you want to talk to people about it? Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a mixture of both. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, and that's the thing. There, being honest about there, it. There, is a, there is a certain... There are certain people that I that I definitely called out a couple of months ago over the Jalen stuff that would not engage with me in a dialogue about it. And that so at that point, it's yeah, it's because it, it, it's funny to me. It's funny and it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> at least you're honest about it. I mean, that's step one of it. But <laughs> I mean, I've had that where I've, I mean, it does feel good to like if you're right about something and someone's wrong. Hey, I got you here. But usually that's because they were being <laughs> disrespectful of you. But again, it all goes back to the question of like, what's the purpose of it? Like, are you gaining something that moves you forward out of it? Or are you just doing it because all oh, it feels good to dunk on someone at the moment? And ultimately, that sort of stuff doesn't really get you anywhere. It doesn't kind of lead you in the right direction. Me going back and saying, oh, I was right about this one player, like, I could have a hundred people show up and say, you're right about these a hundred or you're wrong about these a hundred players. Guess what? Yep. <laughs> so yep. it, yeah, I, I, you could go down a, a pretty deep rabbit here and like the effects of social media and, and Twitter and that sort of stuff. Um, again, that's why I mostly just stay off nowadays because hey, ain't you the Kurt Benkert guy? <laughs> but I think, I think from a professional level, it's, it's harmful. I'll say that. I like I like Twitter specifically because, I mean, first off, the dopamine. Let's just be honest. It is a dopamine hit, like scrolling through there for information. You know, people that really like information. And that's me, is I love information and being able to digest it quickly. And that's Twitter. And the I think the other thing, too, is it's so it's such a great networking app because especially for this field because for the most part people are running their own accounts you know and they're it's their access their access to it and they'll see your stuff and you know you can have those conversations with people on espn or el elsewhere just you know if they happen yeah. to be in, in that sort of conversational mode where they're interacting and i think that's always that's just the nice thing about it is that everybody the intention of Twitter is that everyone is just a person and you're just engaging and you're having fun, having conversations about the same stuff because you have shared interest. And so I enjoy that. Um, but yeah, the entire effect of it and what it does in terms of, you know, from a psychological standpoint with the different um, like narciss narcissism and different things like that, like that's a whole nother rabbit hole that I think that you were insinuating at kind of plays into that question that I was asking you about how do you set how do you separate you know the arg the argument from um, you know the disagreement from your opinion you know I but. think 
I, I would just add in here, I think also being such a public platform where everyone sees what everyone says. Yeah. There's a, an aspect of defending yourself so others see it if you're attacked. And mm -hmm. that leads to kind of this, and again, I haven't done a ton of research on this, this is more anecdotal, but it leads to you digging in your heels and trying to fight back against someone who disagrees with you when, you know, if you're just sitting there talking with them, it's, it's an entirely different thing. I don't know if you've had this situation with many people, but like I've had times where I've had back and forth with people that are pretty disagreeable and, 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 uh, you know, frustrating. And then you, you chat with them, you know, and you're cool. Like, it's just, a, it's a very different environment between like, let's say what we're doing right here, going back and forth versus if we were having a conversation on Twitter in front of, you know, hundreds of people where people were liking and quote tweeting and go, you know, <laughs> it, it's a, it's an entirely different thing. Um, and so I think there's a lot of grandstanding and posturing on there that happens solely because of that social aspect of it. Yes. Again, this is more anecdotal than stuff I've researched into, but I think that certainly does play a part of it. And when someone has a, has an opinion, if they feel pushed on it, like Kenny Pickett QB1 and someone pushes back, you feel more obligated to continue to you know dig in and, and fight that. Versus if we're just chatting and I just say, Kenny Pickett QB1, you say, no, he's not. Okay. Cool. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and I guess I would also add to that, I think in general, this goes down the whole thing of bias and all that and scouting, but this is something I, I learned from both listening to, I don't know if you listened to that, uh, that Les Snead, uh, Annie Duke podcast that I had like the whole, <laughs> whole podcast clipped and put on Twitter. But one of the things they talked about was this aspect of like Les's job listening to scouts go back and forth is not to make everyone in the room agree because you're not going to convince a bunch of people who are experts in their field, who have done it for a long time, who watched the same player with their own eyes and seen things and put down notes on what they saw with these guys. You're not going to convince them that their eyes lied to them. It's impossible. What you saw is what you're going to believe. And so I could send you into the gladiator arena and have you go back and forth and you'll fight until you're, you're half dead and we're not going to get any closer to where we need to be. You're just going to continue to slam against each other and fight, right? Because you believe your eyes didn't lie to you. And so you don't need that necessarily. You're like, each person's perspective is valuable in its own because of the experience they bring. You know, if I have a coach who says this and a scout who says this, I'm not going to make them go to war to get like the best opinion. I just want to know, hey, what do you think on each side? And you have all that information out there of what they think, and then you put it together for the best possible answer. And so if I see two people arguing on Twitter, it's going to be, okay, well, what do you guys think and why? And and if you just end up just calling each other idiots and going back and forth yelling at each other, oh, I can't believe this guy. He's so stupid. It's like, what are we gaining here? You're just trying to, trying to hit the other person over the head with a club. You don't get anything from it. And, 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 it's, and, and it's draining mentally too. Like you, you're yeah. just going to wear yourself out. You've got better things to do, man. You got 24 hours in a day and how much of that's actually free. Like you want to waste that little bit of free time to where you're just going to fight with someone online. Okay. Yeah. And I think, um, I think that almost hurts people to a certain extent in this particular industry because they spend so much time almost creating this this you know opinion and making this opinion identify themselves and i think that hurts them in the long run in terms of what they can what they could be doing to be getting better as an evaluator as someone who's watching tape seeing things differently and i think that's my approach has turned into i want to approach everything with an open mind and in an open discussion because i I like you you said yeah, I'm not right about a hundred percent of stuff like there's a lot that I it's like the circle concept you have the big giant circle and you ask someone who's you know how much this if this circle is all of the knowledge in the world in existence how much of that do you know <laughs> and a really smart person might go on there and say well let's I'll I think about three percent and they mark off a little three percent like so this 97 percent is everything that you don't know you know, and so I like to approach it like a, I know maybe point zero one percent of that, <laughs> you know, and because of all this possibility out there, there there has to be, I have to keep an open mind because there could very well potentially be 
a better solution to something that I'm doing or some approach that I have. But yeah, that's um, interesting because uh, I I'm thinking it's the availability bias, which it actually I saw a, a basically what you described the circle of hey here's all the stuff that is out there and here's the tiny little sliver of stuff you know and if you walk in with the confidence of like I know 80 percent like you're gonna get knocked down very very quickly um, yeah but yeah it's obviously if you're working in this field professionally you have to be confident in your opinions when I watch a player I have to say this is what I saw here's why here's what I believe he's gonna be and I have to say it with the confidence of someone who does it professionally and that's okay I'm fine doing that but at the same time, I have to go in and not, again, attach myself, my identity to being right on something. My my identity is attached to my ability to continually learn, improve, and get better at what I do and do it to the best of my ability. I can't do anything more than that. I can't say I'm going to be right all the time because you're not going to be. So what do you attach your identity to? You know, um, And I think, like you said, when you get on a lot of the media side stuff, there is that aspect of people attach that to I have to, do I have to do better than this person do better than that person it's like you you can't wanting to be right no matter how hard you want to be right does not make you right <laughs> seeking more information and continually trying to improve your viewpoint is going to hopefully make you more right um there's a couple of things i want to touch on but i'm going to blank out here in terms of where where i was going with it so if you want to keep it moving right but um no you see that all the time the, the entire availability bias. Actually, you you mentioned that that made me think. Remember, uh, I think Elon Musk had posted that meme a couple months ago that was like 50 different biases that you might be experiencing in your life. That was such an awesome thing to like go through and check and just be like, oh yeah, I do that. Oh yeah, I do that one too. Like like it's just stuff that you're not even really fully aware of that you're doing and I think that's the last important thing in this field from what I've learned is to be constantly checking yourself. And it's not a lack of confidence that why you're checking yourself constantly. It's you have to have to some extent a a, a, a form of humility, because if you don't, like you said, you walk in the room thinking, you know, 80 percent of that circle, you're going to get knocked to the ground really, really fast because you don't. Mm -hmm. And the humility is sort of that virtue in this field that's most important to me. In the sense that you can understand that you're going to be wrong on at least 50% of it. Because that's just how it goes in this field. Like, you know, the NFL doesn't even hit on 50% of the picks. So you're going to be wrong 50% of the time at least. And you just need to keep looking at, okay, well, why was I wrong? How can I get better? That's the most important thing, I think, in scouting, in media, in all of that that you do, like is where did I get this wrong? How am I not going to do this again? You know, and Lamar Jackson is such a great example because so many of us missed on Lamar. Like I was, I missed on Lamar too. Like I was, no, he's not going to be, he shouldn't be playing quarterback. I don't know why he won't run his 40 yard dash, blah, blah, blah right there with that Bill Polian mindset that year. And uh, I was wrong. That's all there is to it. But it gets really dangerous when you start <clears throat> taking those players, you know, and those evaluations and those things because you don't have that humility to just let it go and say, you know what, I was wrong. It's okay. That's part of the field. And you start almost rooting for the player to succeed or fail, you know, based on your evaluation because of what's happened. And don't get me wrong, we want guys to succeed no matter what. Like that's that's what this football is about, is people being successful, succeeding, rising through the ranks. We're not trying to knock people back because nobody wants that for anybody. But you'll see people and they'll start rooting for this guy to fail because, oh, well, I, I said he didn't do this, this, and that. And he shouldn't be this productive right now. And they almost start talking down and, everything that he's doing. I see it with Jalen a lot specifically. You know, what Jalen Hurts accomplished this year with the Eagles was incredible. Considering all the factors, brand new head coach, brand new offense, 
the scheme wasn't working the first few weeks. They had to make some adjustments. And people were still knocking him after he was making that, that throw to Devontae over Patrick Sertain in the end zone. Showing the ability to go through progressions. Is he a great progressor? No. And he probably won't ever be someone who can really progress very well through a lot of reads, but that's not his game. Like you pointed out, with different quarterbacks, they have different part, parts that they do well with their game. And you just see people getting so into that, well, I didn't think he was going to be successful when he was drafted, and I'm going to you know, continually dismiss what he does because I think he's going to fail. And I think that's where it gets dangerous. That's interesting. Um, you've kind of answered this, but I'll I'll touch on this and, and just ask you. One thing I do want to talk before I get into that, though, is the in regards to the availability bias thing, is you think of like you walk into an NFL room. Imagine you have every scout walking with that mindset of like, oh, I knew everything, but they only know a tiny little percent and they go back and forth arguing. You can miss out on so many good opinions and good insights by just having that closed mindset of like, I knew everything because you're going to miss out on maybe that guy over yeah. there has percent that guy has five percent your goal is to get it all together and collectively get as much of that as you can but if you close your mind to you're not going to get that where i was going to go with it was the jalen hurts thing is people seeking to either hey i was you know i said this about this guy he's he's succeeding now and i want him to fail so i look right where do you think that comes from i think that's an that's a pride that's an ego issue that's basically the response I was leading you into, but yeah. Yeah. So again, it all comes back to like the pride aspect of like, what do you have control over? Yes or no? Do you have control over whether this guy fails or succeeds? No. Your job isn't to, you know, make him like you can't, you can't physically like the Jalen Hurts, you will <laughs> succeed, you know, like you can't do that. And so, and, and you also can't make him fail. What's going to happen is what's going to happen. I mean, if you take Jalen Hurts' career a hundred times over and over again, just with the Eagles, you're going to get probably a little bit different result each time. Maybe gets hurt in one scenario, maybe you know, or let's yeah. say he goes to any of these 32 teams, you're going to get a different result every team you send him to, right? And so you ha that's out of your control. You can't see that far into the future. And so to put your ego on the line trying to predict how a guy's going to perform when you don't even know what team he's going to, yeah, like. Your, your odds of getting that right are incredibly slim. And the smaller you make that bubble of like, let's say average backup to average starter, you close that in and you say, this is what he's going to be right here. And he goes to this team or that team, you're going to get a different result each time. Send Patrick Mahomes to the Bears. You're going to get a different result than Patrick Mahomes <laughs> to the Chiefs. And you might say, oh, my God, Patrick Mahomes, alternative universe. Patrick Mahomes on the Bears, he stinks. Oh, my goodness. We, we saw it coming. Or, oh, my gosh, Patrick Mahomes on the Chiefs, he's the greatest. It's like... You just don't know how things are going to play out, and your goal is just how accurate can I be? Or at least my goal is. I can't speak to other people if they like arguing on Twitter for the for the dopamine. But I think if you're I think if you're a good evaluator seeking to improve your accuracy and be better overall, I think that's your that's your target. I think this has been a really great conversation, and I I certainly hope other people think so too and can take something away. And I really appreciate you taking the hour and a half <laughs> to, to come on here and talk with it. But I guess uh, just to finish out, Mark, like, do you have any final thoughts, opinions, anything to pass on, any information that you might, you know, about what you're doing that you want to have out there? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I'm, again, I'm more in the private side of things now, so I'm not going to say, oh, yeah, go to my website, go do this, go do that. I'm, I won't even bother with the Twitter plug and all that, but um more than anything, I would say, one, I think there's so much value in just having an understanding of what you do and don't know and being accepting of new information, like, without any, you know, how do I put this? Anything that comes your way, you should be able to just take it in without feeling attacked or feel like you have to against it or, you know, you have to bolster it. You're just let the information hit you. This is like, for example, the Angry Scout. I've seen Angry Scout post some things on there politically that I very much disagree with, but I don't follow him for yeah. his politics. I follow him for his information as an evaluator. And I've gained so much insight by just, instead of going, oh, get freaking Angry Scout, this guy, like, 
No, I just take in the information that I want to receive from him. And that's it. Um, and I think having that mentality is, you know, improved me a lot as a scout and, or I should, I'm not a scout, I'm a value leader. That's unfair to the scouts doing school calls, but point stands. Um, and I think it's improved me as a person too, to where I'm not arguing on Twitter all the time with people. I'm just focused on, hey, I get to sit here and watch football all day. Let me maximize that instead of having to waste my time for other stuff. Yeah. And I'm trying to think if there's a good two. I didn't come prepared with a good one-two punch closing line here. <laughs> I guess I would just say, John, I appreciate you having me on. I'm always down to talk about this stuff. There's so many ways you could go into this with the process stuff. Um, and always, it's it's tough to do it in this format because there's so much to unpack in this industry. Yeah. You get so deep into the weeds with certain things with scouting processes. Um, I could sit here and ramble for an hour and a half about different things with the biases and how you evaluate and, you know, keeping information siloized and all that sort of stuff. But um, we can save that for another time if you ever want to bring me back on. Oh, 100%, Mark. Uh, we, we have a summer coming up where, you know, we'll probably take a couple weeks off after the draft. Most, I, I don't know about you. I would imagine you would kind of enjoy the family, and then we start to work back into into the season, and then – there's all this filler content, right? And so there's really not anything going on in football. So we're just kind of, that's a really great time to really start exploring processes specifically, you know? And I, when I asked you if you wanted to come on this with me, I kind of pointed out like, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be shy about it. I'm, I'm going after the, you know, the, the Joe Rogan experience type format because what that does is it oh, it opens the door to anything. Like there's nothing that's off the table in the conversation. There's nothing that's that we're worried about. Okay, well we don't have enough time for this. Well let's make the time. You know, <laughs> let's talk about it. And I, because there is so much to this process. There's so much to you know the NFL. There's so much to the NFL draft. There's so much to scouting. There's just there's unlimitless conversation here. And the plan is, yeah, definitely, Mark, we'll have you back on. I mean, we'll talk more about that kind of stuff. We'll go into psychology and all that different other stuff. I'll be the idiot at that point. I'll be just, yeah, Mark, you're talking because I'm not a psychologist and I don't really study it exclusively outside of just from what I understand and what I've experienced, you know, with other people. But, yeah, I think that there's a lot of this, this, pod, this, uh, this podcast idea, this format is not to limit you know, it's not to condense. It's free form. It's however long we want to talk. Like we just roll with it. Gotcha. But yeah, I appreciate you taking the time again. And I really enjoyed the conversation. I really enjoyed the tips I got and stuff, uh, which is why I like having you on. I always come away with a few things that I hadn't thought of yet or thought of in a certain way. And uh, yeah, man, I love it. I appreciate it. I see your bookshelf back there. I have to add some psychology books to it. <laughs> get, your pre get your prepared, man. There's pretty much every record and fact book between 1980-something to 2014. Um, some encyclopedias. Uh, actually, so there's a America's Sports Best Sports Writing, which is a collection of articles written from the 50s to the 90s. Uh, just some of the best sports writing article pieces ever. Uh, there's a bunch of different stuff back there, but mostly that. <laughs> no psychology. <laughs> well, I'll add one for you here if you want before we go. And this is one I would suggest to anyone that if it's like, okay, what's one that you would pick out? And this is one I actually got from listening to, I believe it was Andrew Barry on a podcast, but it's Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman. It really unwraps a lot of the, the ways you can deceive yourself with your thinking. And uh, it's... It's almost like reading a, I don't want to say like a puzzle or riddle book, but like it'll give you an example and you can, okay, let me read through it and do this. And you'll realize the biases that capture you and catch you. And it is really eye opening in that regard in terms of the way your mind processes information. Um, so that's one I would recommend as a, as a starter. It's, it's huge. It's like 500 something pages, but it's a, it's a very worthwhile read for just, it changes the way you think about thinking essentially, I would say that. Thinking fast and slow is what it's called. 
Yeah, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, which I'm sure, John, you know, he's the guy I always spam clips on of for Twitter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I'll check it out for sure. That's awesome. Thanks again, man. Appreciate everything and uh, look forward to talking to you again. For sure, man.